Chapter 32, The Worst Things to Say If Pa didn't get him first, Virgil figured one of three things would happen. He would suffocate, starve, or die of thirst. He didn't know which was worse. Maybe all of them would happen. Maybe he wouldn't be able to breathe and his tummy would rumble until it made his heart stop and his throat would close up, dry as a bone, and it would all happen at the same time. How much air was in an abandoned well anyway? Was there a limited supply? Would it eventually run out? Would Pa come back? An army of tears surged up from his gut. He squeezed his eyes shut to stop them from gushing out, then looked up, 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 trying to see if there were ways for air to get inside, but it was completely dark. If light couldn't get in, how would air ever make it? Doesn't matter much, said Virgil, since I'm going to starve anyway. He fed Gulliver a dandelion. He couldn't see him, but he felt the tug of Gulliver's teeth against the stem and heard the faint munching as he chewed it down. I'm sorry, Gulliver, said Virgil. I got us into a big mess. What happened next was inevitable. It was bound to happen, even if Virgil didn't want it to. Honestly, it would happen to anyone. Virgil began to cry. The tears pushed up from somewhere deep in his belly, shifted into his throat, and then dribbled out like water from a leaky faucet. He tried desperately to stop them. He hated crying. He hated how it made his face wet and his eyes puffy and his throat hurt, but there was no stopping it. The tears came harder and with ferocity until the faucet wasn't just leaking, it was pouring, and Virgil had to catch his breath between sobs. Maybe he was being weak or a baby, or a frightened turtle. So what, though? He was afraid. He was trapped in a pit without a friend in the world, and he was afraid. He'd heard once that before you die, you see your life flash before your eyes. He wasn't exactly dying just yet, but a few flashes came anyway. He thought of Lola. He thought of her hands, and how they felt like paper. He thought of all her stories, how she would complimented his fingers and said he should be a pianist, and how she taught him about Pa and the stone boy, and the sun queen. Too bad she'd never told him a story about how to escape a well, and now she never would. He thought of his parents and brothers, the way they spoke in exclamation points and always teased him for being too shy, too quiet, and how they thought it was silly that he was afraid of the dark. He thought of how he used to imagine that he'd been floating in a river like Moses, and his mother just happened to find him. Maybe she picked him up and said, What's this? A baby with no parents. I'll take him home straight away, speaking in exclamation points, as usual. And then he went home with her, and everyone realized quickly that he didn't exactly fit in. But that was okay, because they loved him anyway. And he loved them too, of course, even if he didn't understand them. And now he never would. And he thought of Valencia. He wiped his snotty nose with the back of his hands and then wiped them on his pants. Usually he wouldn't do such a thing, but the rules didn't matter now. He was suffocating in a land of lost opportunities where he should have talked to Valencia, told Lola that he loved her, tried to understand his parents and brothers, thanked Kaori for being such a good friend to him. And now it was too late for any of that. Pa would come eventually, he was certain. And even if Pa didn't come, snatching Gulliver as an appetizer before going after the main course, there was still no hope. Virgil took big, heaving breaths. He cried until the faucet ran dry. How would anyone find him? The bull was his only hope for rescue, and there was a fat chance of that happening. The bull had probably forgotten all about him already. Or maybe he was back in his devil's den, making a note in his log of evil deeds. First day of summer. Trapped Virgil Salinas in a well. Virgil's cheeks ached. His eyes burned. His nose throbbed. Crying hurt. That's why he hated it so much. Crying is good for the soul, said Ruby softly. It means something needs to be released. And if you don't release the something, it just weighs you down until you can hardly move. There's nothing else for me to do, Virgil said. His voice was hoarse from the weeping. You should try yelling again. Virgil pressed the heels of his hands against his eyes. What's the point? No one can hear me. Of all the questions you ever ask yourself in life, never ask, what's the point? It's the worst 
question in the world, Ruby said. You sound like Lola. Good. I miss her. He said it quietly, embarrassed even in front of himself. But it needed to be said. When you say things aloud, you let them go. Lola had told him that once, but it didn't feel like it worked because he still missed her. It's not like you're never going to see her again, Ruby said. How do you know? No one will ever find me. No one will ever save me. There's no chance. Of all the things you ever tell yourself in life, never say, there's no chance. Okay, it's too late then, Ruby sighed. The sound traveled like a curl of invisible smoke. That's even worse, she said. Virgil slumped against the wall. He wanted to sleep through the starvation, but he couldn't. Not with Pa out there somewhere. Maybe Pa was just above his head now, watching, waiting to swoop down, circling like a vulture. Virgil didn't dare look up to see. It was too dark anyway, just as Pa liked it. Virgil held his breath. Was that a feather against his cheek? Was that a rustling? He put his hands over his ears. Try yelling for help again, said Ruby. I don't want to. It might... It might what? Startle Pa from his invisible perch and send him down for us. I told you. He only grows if you're afraid of him, said Ruby. Ignore Pa. Just yell. Do it for me. Virgil dropped his hands slowly. All was quiet. You just you can't just give up, Ruby said. There's a time when a person has to give up. That's just the truth. Give me an example, said Ruby. I'm too tired to give examples. Don't avoid the question just because you don't want to think of an answer. Virgil sighed. He thought for a moment. Okay, let's say you're running a race. It's a really, really long race, too. And you sign up because you think you can do it. You practice running for months, maybe even years. And then the big race comes, and you're running and running, and suddenly your legs are tired, and you're dehydrating, and you can hardly breathe, and the finish line is still way down the road and stuff, but you just can't make it. You start throwing up or something. If you keep going, you know you'll drop dead, so you stop. And you sit on the side of the road so you don't die. You have to give up or else. That's a terrible example, said Ruby immediately. Virgil's eyebrows bunched together. He glared into the darkness. No, it's not. Yes, it is. What makes it a terrible example? Because the person in your story didn't give up. Giving up would have been never starting the race at all. Virgil sighed again. I want to sleep. Will you watch out for me? I will. If you yell for help one last time. Promise? I promise, Bayani. Make it a good one. Virgil took a big, deep breath. He filled his chest with air, opened his mouth wide, and yelled and yelled until his voice gave out.